Hi everyone, here is your Unit 3 Populations Test Review. It will cover both animal and human populations, uh, but the majority of the test is going to focus on human populations, calculations, TFRs, age structures, and demographic transition. So make sure you pay extra careful attention to your notes on the human populations. It was part one and part two. Let's start off with covering life strategies since you will have to apply K and R selected organisms to some other things such as the survivorship curves in the test. Um, so your R-selected individuals are usually going to be smaller organisms, so things like mice, bacteria, rabbits, um, even weeds as well. And they're typically going to um, sexually mature very, very early on in their life. So let's say you are a mouse, maybe within two or three months you're able to start reproducing and you'll probably start having babies right away. You're also going to have a lot of offspring um, as a little mouse or a bacteria, and you probably are going to offer very little parental care, if any, um, because you are not particularly expecting your offspring to live very long. So typically as an R-selected individual, you compensate by over reproducing. Um, these organisms also have pretty short lifespans. Compare this to K-selected individuals where they're often going to be larger, so think like larger mammals. They'll usually mature sexually later in life, so let's say that you're a human, you're not going to be sexually mature until you hit puberty um, in your teens, or if you're an elephant, you might be you know, 8 to 10 years old before that occurs. You're going to have few offspring at a time and offer a lot of parental care because you're expecting those one or two offspring that you have at a time to survive and make it to adulthood, and you're probably going to have a much longer lifespan. Um, so we'll take a look at comparing these with survivorship curves in a few minutes. You're going to need to understand some concepts around growth patterns for different types of organisms as well. So for example, um, a lot of organisms are going to experience exponential growth early on in their population. So when their populations are small, when they don't really have any limits on food and on resources, they'll grow at a near vertical rate after they get going, so like we see in the graph on the right. Um, this is rare for organisms to maintain for very long though. So if you look at the logistic growth, notice that it kind of starts out exponential, so we get that kind of rapid growth, but as populations approach their limits on food and resources and water, which we know is carrying capacity, also abbreviated as K by the way, um, they will start to slow down their population growth. So notice that the curve kind of starts to become more horizontal and then typically once they approach carrying capacity they'll kind of hover around it. Um, so we usually see the graphs where they level out horizontally but they're more likely to hover a little bit, sometimes going over carrying capacity, um, sometimes going back under it again. But anytime a population is under carrying capacity they have a tendency to increase back up toward carrying capacity. You're definitely going to need to know survivorship curves, and they will likely be labeled type 1, type 2, and type 3, um, and you'll need to be able to identify characteristics based on those particular types. Um, so for example, your type 1 curve, which is usually your top one um, on your graphic, is going to show a lifespan where most individuals, so if you follow the pink line there, are going to live um, to usually a kind of maximum critical life point, so kind of where I put the little star. Um, so let's say this, peop this is people. Most people are going to probably live to maybe, you know, age 65 or 70, and then we will start to see a sharp decline in survivorship. So there's very little infant mortality. Notice that this line at the beginning stays pretty horizontal, um, and we will continue to see most individuals make it to adulthood and then we'll see that decline later in life. So that is your type one curve. This is often going to also be K-selected populations where we have more parental care and less offspring produced. All right, then we see our type two populations which are going to show pretty much an equal chance at dying throughout their lifespan. So if you notice, we just have kind of this downward drop here. Um, this means they may be infants, they may be older, or they may be adults in the middle of their life. Um, they have just as equal a chance of dying at any given point. So this is common in birds. Then we have our type 3 survivorship. And this is going to be your individuals that have a large drop early on. Usually this means a high infant death rate. Um, these are often your R-selected individuals as well, so they often overproduce offspring and have very little parental care. But if they make it to kind of a critical age, so like about right in there, they're liable to continue their life and make it to their full term, if however long that is for that particular species. Let's go over a little bit more on carrying capacity since we mentioned exponential and logistic growth. So the graph that you're seeing on the right is a 
logistic growth graph. We show some early on rapid growth, but it levels out as it reaches carrying capacity. Um, a couple of things that you need to know about this are going to include that if overshoot occurs, um, you are going to have populations decline as a result of lack of resources. All right, so what this means is if there's a population that does go over carrying capacity, we are gonna have to see them come back down because once they get over carrying capacity, um, up here, just like we saw with our lesson of the Kaibab graph, is that they ran out of food and water and other resources. And so they were not able to sustain that population number and they had to come back down. And usually they'll come back to carrying capacity and again, kind of hover around carrying capacity at that point. Um, and carrying capacity is gonna be based on resources. So again, that's food, water, um, maybe space or availability of mates. So your density dependent factors that we learned about in unit two. All right, on the test for age structures, you're gonna to need to be able to identify different things such as birth rates, um, potential TFRs, and living conditions of a country based on the shape of the age structure. Um, so with the age structure seen, you can see there's varying rates of growth, but then we also have blue is your pre-reproductive, yellow is your reproductive age group, and orange is your post-reproductive older individuals. So let's start with the one on the left. Um, notice that this particular age structure shows a very wide pyramid shape with a very wide base. So that wide base is indicating a lot of younger individuals and likely a lot of future growth in the country because those younger individuals will become your reproducers in the next decade or so. Um, notice that your older individuals, it's very small and skinny at the top, which means there's probably very little medical care and they're not living a very long time. Notice with our next one, our slow growth, we see more of a skinny base so notice where it's through that arrow, it's shrunken in compared to the rapid growth pyramid. And we're seeing a lot of older individuals, notice up top especially, people are living even longer. And there's more of an orange area, which means we have a longer lifespan and better medical care. As we go to zero growth, notice that we are more of a rectangular shape. Um, we don't see any flare out at the bottom of the pyramid whatsoever. So what this means is our TFR is probably at replacement level, and remember replacement level is about two, which is one baby to replace mom, one baby to replace dad. And if we look at our last pyramid, notice it's almost an inverted pyramid shape. We have it really shrunken in. Um, at the bottom, there's a lot less individuals being born, so we are likely experiencing negative growth or basically decline. So you may have a total fertility rate less than replacement level. So let's talk a little bit more about total fertility rates. So this is the number of babies on average that women in a particular country have between the ages of 15 and 45. So we know that in poor, less developed countries, we tend to see very high TFRs. They could be as much as six or more. Um, whereas in more developed countries, TFRs tend to be closer to replacement fertility, which is two. Again, that's two babies, one to replace mom and one to replace dad, which is why we know it as replacement fertility. You're not going to see a population stabilize until they get closer to replacement fertility. It doesn't have to hit exactly two, um, but usually we need to get as close to two as possible um, to have stabilization of a population that's rapidly growing previously to occur. Um, higher TFRs in less developed countries occur for a variety of reasons. Um, remember the factors that we talked about in class, I gave you guys the little sentence, the moms just don't like labor and birth, and each of those letters corresponded to factors that influence whether you have a higher low TFR. So for example, higher TFRs usually come from less medical care, which is what your M is for. When there's less economic opportunities or jobs for women, usually TFRs are higher as well. So if you were to reverse those and have better medical care and more jobs for women, you're typically going to start to lower TFRs. And that's what we usually see occur in more developed countries. Um, other factors that can contribute are things like infant death. High TFRs usually correlate with high infant deaths and vice versa, so low TFRs, low infant death. Um, better literacy in women begin to lower your TFR. Um, so uh, does the lack of need for child labor as well. So in less developed countries, children are often needed in the home to help make money so that labor um, is an issue. And then also birth control access. When you have less access to birth control, it means more babies. Um, more access to birth control as countries become more developed is typically going to lower the overall birth rate and growth rate of a country. Let's take a minute to look at a couple of population calculations. So you're going to need your rate of growth formula memorized, which is your birth rate or B, your immigration rate, which is I. Remember, I is for into the country, so it's like a birth. And then you'll have D for death and E for emigration or exiting the country, and that is like a 
death in the country. Um, so for rate of growth, let's say that we have a birth rate of 10, we'll have a death rate of five, and let's say immigration is pretty high in the country, so we'll have an immigration rate of five and an immigration rate, people maybe aren't leaving the country, so we'll just have an immigration rate of one. So these are all going to be per 1,000 individuals in the country. Um, if you get a question on the test that says that it's for the entire number in the country, for example, if there's 100,000 in a country or in a city, um, and there is a birth rate of 100, um, a number that high probably means that that is per that 100,000. So don't forget, you might have to convert those numbers like we did in class last week. Um, right now, these are actually going to be crude birth rates and crude death rates. Um, so they are already set to per 1,000. Um, and then remember with your rate of growth, because these are people, we actually need to divide all this by 10 um, since we're dealing with crude birth and death rates. So what we'll do to set this up is we will have 10 births plus five immigrants with an I minus our five deaths. We're going to add to that our immigrants, which is just one out of the country, and set all of this over 10 because we are dealing with people here. So we've got to use the divide by 10 to be able to use the crude birth rate and death rate. So we have 10 plus 5 is going to give us 15. We're going to subtract. 6, again all over 10, which is going to give us 9 over 10. And remember, you're able to use your calculator in class, so don't forget to bring it on Tuesday. So 9 over 10 is going to give us 0.9% growth rate. And a lot of the mistakes I'm seeing with these calculations are people are just not dividing properly. Um, so I'd see things like 90%. So make sure that you are dividing correctly. Um, it is 0.9% growth rate. All right, the other thing that you're going to have to do is your doubling time or rule of 70, which is your doubling time equals 70 divided by whatever your rate of growth is. Um, so the rate of growth, leave it as whatever the number is in percent form. So let's say that our rate of growth is 2%, we would just do 70 divided by 2. And that means our doubling time is going to be just 35 years. Now, if we had a smaller growth rate that was in um, a decimal percentage form, like the previous one where it was 0.9%, um, we would see a much higher number for the number of years because the growth rate is a lot smaller. So again, bring your calculator. You're welcome to use it on the exam. Um, you will not be able to use a phone calculator, though, so please make sure you have an actual calculator with you. Scientific or graphing, either one is fine. On the test, you're also going to see demographic transition models. Um, so they're going to look similar to what you see on the right, although sometimes that total population line in red is not actually included. So just be familiar with what we went over in class where we did some annotation on this as far as like what the death rates look like, what the birth rates look like, and how the populations change and advance over time. So for example, in your pre-industrial stage one part of uh, your demographic transition, notice that both your birth rate and death rate are very high. So not very good living conditions. You may have a struggling economy. It might be a very war-torn country. Um, it's going to be a country that is probably struggling with high birth rates uh, through high TFRs. If we go into stage two, notice that the first thing to decline is death rate. So that blue line drops first. So as a country becomes more advanced, um, you are going to see death rate drop before birth rate drops, which if you notice, it does not actually start to drop until the end of stage two transitioning and moving into industrialization. So as a country becomes more industrialized, we see that birth rate drop. You're going to see a pretty big part um, of the population growing kind of at that point right there between stage two and three because your death rate's dropping and your birth rate's still pretty high. So that difference in higher birth rate than death rate is going to lead to population growth, which if you notice, we see our total population line going up. Your last stage is post-industrialization, and notice birth and death rate kind of approach the same value. And we may uh, continue to see a tiny bit of growth if the birth rate is above it at all, but eventually those populations of post-industrialized countries begin to go into a declining stage um, where your birth rate may be at replacement fertility or even lower. Thank you for listening to this presentation. I hope it's going to help on your test tomorrow. Um, be sure to watch the Edpuzzle to the end and complete all the questions so that you can get your extra credit uh, for your exam. Good luck tomorrow.